you can get out on time, and so I'm ready to rumble here. And we're going to cover the entire chapter. Remember, there is no, no class next week. So it's Easter, and I want to give you a chance to be with your family all day if that's something that you want to do and or can do. So no class next week. Then we'll be in chapter 7, uh, the Sunday after Easter. So if you have a card, we have a card that gives you a full schedule of... Uh, uh, those cards are back there. Where's Bernie? I guess he's got them back there. Yeah, I have a few of these left. So uh, it tells you the schedule up through the end of April. Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. <coughs> Father in heaven, we're just grateful for who you are. And as we look to the one sitting on the throne... We just marvel at the glory and the majesty of the enthroned God. And Father, I pray I can do justice to this beautiful, beautiful passage that we're going to look at today. Perhaps uh, one of the most famous of all chapters in the book of Isaiah. And God, it just gives us a picture of your glory, of your majesty, of who you are, and why we can put our trust in you. So, honor, I pray, the teaching of your word, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. I wonder if you've ever had a life-changing experience. Have you ever had one of those experiences where it literally turned your life around and headed you into a totally different direction? I have. It was my personal call into the ministry. When I was in high school, my whole desire was to be a commercial artist, or even better than that, I wanted to design automobiles. I've always been fascinated with the design of automobiles, and I would hope one day I might work for Ford or General Motors, and I did end up getting a scholarship, uh, two of them, in fact, to Chouinard Art Institute, which at the time was in Los Angeles, now owned by uh, the Disney Corporation. And then after that, I got into Art Center School in Pasadena, which is the leading uh, automobile design school in the United States. And so I thought, I'm on my way. Now, I'm 20 years of age at the time, and I was asked to teach high school class at my church. And over the process of teaching, the class became so large, it became a third of the entire congregation. We had 118 high school kids, and the entire attendance in the church was 333. That counted the 118 high school kids. So I had people coming to me saying, you need to be in the ministry. And I thought, wow, you know, I never gave that much thought before. I'm going to art school. I want to design automobiles. And then I entered a preacher contest sponsored by Standard Publishing Ohio. I won first place. <laughs> so as a result of that, I had Bible colleges all across the country showing some interest in my enrollment. Well, immediately the Lord took away from me the desire to design automobiles. And that's how I got involved in the ministry and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which I've done now for nearly 60 years, counting my time in this class. So, that's a life-changing experience for me. And so we're going to see that Isaiah had a life-changing experience as well. God calls his servants in various ways, and today we're going to learn how God called Isaiah to be a prophet to Judah, as well as the house of Israel. We will see that Isaiah, too, had this life-changing experience when he had a vision of the glory and the majesty of the enthroned God. So, Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to look at the first four verses. Notice the appearance of God on His throne. And I want you to see, first of all, the calendar of time. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. King Uzziah died in 740 B.C. after 52 years of reign as king over Judah. It was the second longest in Judah's history. Only the evil King Manasseh served longer at 55 years. So I want to acquaint you just a little bit with Uzziah. 
He started his reign at the age of 16. He was a godly and successful king as he mounted a campaign against the Philistines, the primary enemy of Israel. He destroyed the walls of several chief Philistine cities. He built military outposts near the territory of the Philistines to give further security to the people of Judah. He refortified the walls of Jerusalem with its watchtowers. He constructed many cisterns in the wilderness, making widespread settlements possible. He subdued his enemies on the east side of the Jordan River as he armed his troops with the most advanced weapons. In the end, however, God afflicted him with leprosy. Still, his legacy was one who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. I think that would be the epitaph that I'd like to have on my gravestone. I would like it to be said of me, and I think it would be something said of you. One who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So we would ask the question, why would God afflict Uzziah with leprosy when he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord? Well, Uzziah was a sinner like all of us, but he made one serious mistake. When God prospered him for being an obedient king, he also punished him for doing one thing that God instructed kings not to do, and that was to play the role of a priest. But that's what King Uzziah decided to do. He entered into the holy place of the temple, and he lit the incense at the altar of incense, symbolic of the prayers, you know, the smoke that would come from that altar ascending up into heaven. Well, there were those priests who tried to resist him from doing that, and God afflicted him with leprosy. That was a very humbling disease, as it meant isolation from everyone. The fame he so relished, he no longer could enjoy. The grace of God humbled him and brought him back into a right relationship with his God. What befell Uzziah has fallen on many spiritual leaders. They become successful and influential. Then they become prideful and allow demands of their time to keep them from a time of prayer and personal study of the Word. Temptation comes along, whether it's financial or whether it's sexual. They fall into sin. That ends their ministry, or at least curtails it for a while. And while the grace of God can forgive them when they repent, rarely is their ministry what it once was. My wife likes to watch Dr. Oz, and this week on Dr. Oz, they had a story about the pastors of Hillside, uh, Hillsong Church in Australia. Hillsong is the largest church in the continent of Australia. They have something like 50 congregations all around the world, about 150 part of the Hillsong ministry. Uh, Hillsong is very famous music that they put forth, because if you go to Mariners, you'll hear Hillsong music. This church doesn't do Hillsong music for reasons that maybe I'll tell you later. But anyway, uh, many, many of our churches do Hillsong and Bethel music. But here are those pastors now that have been found guilty of sexual discretion or indiscretion, and even mishandling the finances of the church. And so I'm wondering what is going to happen to the Hillsong ministry and how many of those people that have been influenced by that ministry are now going to be turned away from the Lord because of the unfaithfulness of several of their pastors. Well, that happens in the ministry. So uh, it was at the death of Uzziah. Anyway, this is what we need to talk about. It was at the death of Uzziah, the leprous king, that God extended a call to Isaiah to prophesy over Judah and the house of Israel. So the year that we're talking about now is 740 B.C. That's the date I want you to have in mind. That's the year King Uzziah died. So we see the calendar of time. Next we see the certainty of God's presence. Now Isaiah writes, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. 
And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah had a life-changing experience. He saw the glory and the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. A little later, I'm going to take you to John chapter 12, verses 38 through 41, because John tells us who it was that was sitting on the throne. It was not God the Father, as we would first of all think. It was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Because in that passage in John, he's specifically talking about Jesus, and then he goes back and he quotes from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10, and then he goes on to say, this was the vision that the prophet Isaiah saw. He saw Jesus Christ sitting on the throne. Isaiah has learned the throne of Judah has changed, has changed occupants. Isaiah was dead. But Jesus Christ was still on his throne in perfect control of everything. You know, life is full of changes. Leaders come and leaders go. God raises up kings and God takes them down. Yes, there is a level above all worldly leaders, and that one who occupies that level is the sovereign one over all, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. That ought to encourage us at a time like this. When we become discouraged about the leadership of our nation and how our president and Congress want to lead our nation away from the truths of God's Word, remember they can do no more than what God allows. He is the ultimate decision maker. Instead of looking to President Biden and his liberal agenda, look to the one above him who is the Lord over Biden and Harris and the U.S. Congress. I'm not saying they know him. I'm only saying... He is in control over them. Jesus is the one who has the ultimate say-so. The times of discouragement, we need to take our eyes off of men and focus on God's sovereignty, on His holiness, on His glory, on His majesty. We need to look upward and begin to see things from heaven's point of view and know for certain that in the end, our Lord will prevail. So, we've seen the calendar of time. We're talking 740 B.C. We've seen the certainty of God's presence. Isaiah has this vision of the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on the throne in control over everything. Now, notice the clarity of Isaiah's vision. There's four things that he sees in the text that we just read. First of all, he sees sitting on the throne the Lord Himself. The throne is high and lifted up, and the train of his robe fills the temple. That would be uh, the temple up in heaven. So the Lord is sitting on a throne, which meant that the Lord is indeed the true king of Israel. Uzziah is dead. But that doesn't mean they don't have someone watching out for them. Then he was high and exalted, the one on the throne, referring to his position before the nation. And his long robe spoke of his royalty and his majesty. The fact that his presence was in the temple suggests that the temple was his earthly house. That would be Solomon's temple here. And he wanted his people to gather there for worship. When Israel was in the wilderness, God told Moses to build a tabernacle, and it would be the dwelling place of God's people. The tabernacle was later replaced by the temple built by the reign of King Solomon, or during his reign, and it was filled with the glory of God, we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. But there's a passage in Deuteronomy that I want to focus on for a moment. God gave explicit instructions about the place of worship. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 5. You are to seek the place of the Lord your God will choose among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling place, and that must go. The reference at first was to the tabernacle, and later on, of course, to Solomon's temple. 
They were the houses of God where he would meet with his people. It is where his glory was displayed. Therefore, when Isaiah saw the train of God's robe filling the temple, God was saying to him, This is my house, and there I will meet with my people. Does this not suggest that even today God has a specific place he wants to meet with his people? Yes. Oh, yes, our God is omnipresent. Our God is everywhere. You can meet God at the beach. You can meet God at the mountains. You can meet God at the desert. You can meet God at home because God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. But yet, there is a specific place where God wants to meet with his people. It's called the church. And Jesus established his church. Now, the word church in the Greek is the word ekklesia. The word ekklesia was borrowed from the Romans. It's a Greek word, but it was borrowed from the Romans, and it was basically a town hall meeting. And so the word ecclesia called out to be called together. You're, so in, in the days of the Roman Empire, people living in little towns, they were called out of their homes. They were called together as citizens of that town to conduct town business. It was called an ecclesia. So Jesus chooses to use this very same word in the establishment of his church. He says, I want to call people out of their home. I want to call them together as a body of people in order that my kingdom might be advanced through the church. That's why the writer of Hebrews tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Understand, you as an individual are not the church. You're part of the church, but you're not the church. This is the church right here. Because you have come out of your home. We have come together. And we've come to hopefully get good instruction in what God wants us to do. Well, we see the one sitting on the throne is the Lord himself. And the thing that we see about him, first of all, is that he is on the throne. Secondly, he sees seraphim standing above the throne. Notice the word seraphim. It means the burning ones. They were angelic beings who guarded the throne of God. They were glorious six-winged beings whose voices were created to praise God as they repetitiously said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Over and over. I know some of you people don't like some of the repetitious songs that are sung at churches today. You know, it's called 7-Eleven music. You sing the same verse over 11 times. Seven of them, 11 times. You know, you've heard that, I'm sure, before. But understand that these angels, these seraphim, before the throne of God, over and over and over again. It's a repetitious act according to the text. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The earth is full of your glory. Notice uh, also that their uh, eyes... The eyes of the seraphim were made to partially behold God's glory, but when directly in his presence, they had to cover their eyes with two of their wings. Remember, they have six wings. And so they have to cover their eyes with two of their wings. They get a partial glimpse of God. Here they are around the throne of God, above the throne of God. But they have to cover their eyes when they are in the very presence of God. Because the glory of God is so brilliant, not even the angels can behold His glory. So with two of the wings, they cover their eyes. And then what do they do? They look down to the earth. When they can't see the Lord's glory, they look down to the earth and they behold the glory of God's creation on earth. And then it says, with two of their wings, they cover their feet. They're humbling themselves before God. Humbling themselves in the sense that they are servants of God, and you have to be humbled in order to effectively be a servant of God. And with the remaining two wings, they fly. So, two wings, they cover their eyes. Two wings, they cover their feet. Two wings, they fly in order to carry out whatever they're supposed to be doing. And everywhere these seraphim look, they see God's glorious acts. 
They see God orchestrating every life to draw each one to Himself as they look down on the earth. They see the wonder that God would let man even reject Him. That's a hard thing for some people to understand, but remember, here's Stephen preaching to the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his day, these people who ended up stoning him. And what did Stephen say? You have rejected the Holy Spirit. You have rejected the Holy Spirit. It's possible to reject God. He's calling us, but it's possible to reject Him. And the angels of heaven are looking down and they're marveling at the idea that anybody would reject God. They're even marveling at the idea that God would allow it. They also marvel that man could be given the grace to repent and receive forgiveness. They see the beauty of his creation and how uniquely different he is from his creation. And all they can do is praise God for his holiness. And so they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. For the earth is full of his glory. So we see the one sitting on the throne. That's Lord himself, we see the seraphim above the throne, around the throne, six wings, two covering their eyes, two covering their feet, with two they fly. Get the picture? Notice we see the shaking of the temple now. The posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. The doorpost stood on large foundation stones, also referred to as thresholds. When God appeared and His voice cried out, it shook the very foundation stones of the temple. This suggests the awesomeness of God's presence and power. The voice of God is sometimes described in Scripture as thunder. You know, when thunder sounds, we don't miss that sound. It can shake the windows of our homes. Well, it shook the foundation stones here. No one can mistake his voice like thunder. It comes from above. It's loud. Foundations. And then notice next, he sees the smoke that filled the temple. The house was filled with smoke. Now, this is where we get the expression, holy smoke. It's where it comes from. We have a barbecue place just down the street from us. It's not open up yet, but it's called Holy Smoke. Holy Smoke Barbecue. So when it gets open, we're going to have some Holy Smoke Barbecue. <laughs> but this idea of Holy Smoke is better known as the Shekinah glory of God. Actually, the word Shekinah means that which dwells. And the Jewish rabbis used to use this word Shekinah to talk about the presence of God. Because the word Shekinah, you've probably heard it many times, but it's not in the Bible. It's a word that the Jews have come up with in describing the presence of God. This is where God is. Notice, it, it's, it's, it's billows of smoke. Every year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies in the temple to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Now notice this. This is really interesting here. Before he could go behind the veil and enter the Holy of Holies. Remember, the temple had two rooms, the Holy of a holy place. Then there was a veil that separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. That was a symbol of the presence of God to the people. And on the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. Then you had two angels, two seraphims, there on the mercy seat. But now, on the Day of Atonement, the only day in the year in which the high priest was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies, before he could go in, he had to go to the altar of incense which stood in front of the veil, and he had to light the incense, cause wreaths of perfumed smoke to ascend upward, because the incense symbolized the prayers of the people. So every, I mean, in fact, twice a day, that's when the priests would go in. Every day, twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, to make sure that the altar of incense was still lit and the smoke was still ascending. On the Day of Atonement now, the high priest would make sure that it was lit 
before he would go behind the veil. Then, before he actually went into the Holy of Holies, he would take the altar of incense and put it in the Holy of Holies before he entered, filling the Holy of Holies with smoke. Then he could go in. And once he entered, the smoke would then envelop him. It was like the grace of God surrounding him and making and before the ark, which was the visible representation of God to the Israelites. Can't you get the picture now? Here's the high priest, and he's in this room, and it's filled with smoke. The smoke is literally all around him, enveloping him. The idea was, in spite of all the preparation the high priest went through to stand before the presence of God, he was still impure. The smoke was like the grace of God covering him, so not to bring judgment upon him. What a wonderful reminder for us that we too are covered by God's grace that enables us to boldly approach the throne of grace in prayer. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. God's grace, get this now, God's grace is like a holy smoke that continually covers and surrounds us and keeps the judgment of God away from us. Smoke, clouds, and even fire were signs of God's glory and presence. At Sinai, the Lord appeared to Moses in a dense cloud that the people would see when God spoke to Moses. It was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that led the children of Israel in their in, uh, wilderness wanderings. And once the tabernacle was assembled in the wilderness, Moses could not enter the tent of meeting as a cloud rested on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When the high priest entered the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, uh, day of atonement God would appear to him in the cloud above the mercy seat. So get that picture again. Here's that high priest on the Day of Atonement. He's in the Holy of Holies, not only is that room filled with all the smoke from the altar of incense that's enveloping him, but now God's cloud comes. That's the Shekinah glory. God's cloud comes and rests over the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, it was cloudy. It was smoky in that room. John in the book of Revelation speaks of the sanctuary in heaven filled with smoke from God's glory and power so that no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed on earth. I want to get us a picture. Here's John now. This is not Isaiah's vision. This is John's vision. And in, in, in uh, the book of Revelation, now he sees a sanctuary up in heaven. Maybe it was, uh, you know, the temple on earth no longer in John's day, but uh, the, the temple on earth was to be a, a, a replica, so to speak, of the sanctuary or temple up in heaven. Now notice what John is saying here. There's a lot of smoke that's going into that sanctuary up in heaven. And no one was allowed to go into the sanctuary. Now who would those people be? Those would be our loved ones who have died and gone on to heaven. You see, to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. You know people in heaven today. And the day is going to come, what John is saying in the book of Revelation, at the second half of the great tribulation period, this is when you have seven angels with seven bowls of wrath. This is the last three and a half years of the tribulation. And remember, one by one, these angels dump the bowls of wrath upon the earth. Bowl one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And during that time, during the last three and a half years of the tribulation, John says, smoke fills the sanctuary in heaven so no one can enter. Because God is extending his judgment on the earth. Yes, when the Lord appears, He appears as smoke and clouds and sometimes as fire. 
As was the case when Solomon dedicated the temple, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings, and the cloud of His glory filled the temple, and the people fell on their faces and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endures forever. And that's repetitious too. For He is good, His mercy endures forever. For He is good, His mercy endures forever. Amen. So with Isaiah... He has seen a vision of the Lord seated on His throne, and the train of His robe fills the temple. When God's presence filled the temple, the foundations of the temple shook when He spoke, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah had just witnessed the glory and the majesty, the glory and the majesty of the Lord. Well, that's the first four verses. Let's now look at verses 5 through 8, and we see the attitude of Isaiah. Notice the conviction of Isaiah. So I said, after he sees this vision, so I said, Woe is me, woo, for I'm undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I will dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my people have seen the king, or for my eyes, rather, have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. That's verse 5. Isaiah immediately felt unworthy to be in God's presence. He felt dirty. He felt unclean. He suddenly realized the message he had given to Judah was meant for him as well. You see, he's called now to be a prophet. We haven't quite got there yet, but he's called to be a prophet. But he realizes, hey, what I have to say to the people, hey, applies to me. Any pastor who preaches a sermon and thinks the sermon doesn't apply to him, the sermon was not worthy to be preached, or he is too much of an egomaniac to realize he needs what God's Word has to say. I've always tried to measure my teaching. It's, it's you know, there's different things you talk about, but... If I can't benefit from what I'm teaching you, why would I teach you? If I can't get something out of what I have to say here today, if I can't be an encouragement, if I can't be edified by what I'm teaching, why would I be up here wasting your time and my time? And so I have to evaluate what I say by how it affects me. Every pastor had better do that. Because the truth of the matter is, all of us need to say, woe is me, I am undone. Anyway, Isaiah realizes that uh, the message that he's going to preach to the people of Judah, hey, I need that message as well. So when we can behold the perfect and holy presence of God, as did Isaiah... And we can by studying the Scriptures. It ought to humble us. It helps us to see what wretched people we really are. When we place our lives alongside the glory and majesty of God, it makes our sins stand out all the more. It's like throwing black paint on a white wall. The contrast is startling. To see this contrast is necessary if we're going to see our need for God. And when we recognize our need for God, then He covers us with smoke, the smoke of His grace, which blocks out all of our sins so we cannot see them. Can't you get that picture? Just see yourself just covered with holy smoke. It's symbolic of God's grace. And it's so thick. It's so thick that God can't even see the sins in your life because He's purified you. God has to first humble us before He can use us. He has to get us to see how desperate a situation we are in without Him. Once we realize that we are all sinners saved by His grace alone, then God can begin to do a work in us as He did with Isaiah. And so we all come to the same place as Isaiah did before God, we've all got to come to that place where we can say, Woe is me, for I am, a, I am a man of unclean lips. 
that is true acknowledgement of sin and a need to repent, then and only then can we become a useful vessel for the Lord. John Calvin said this, men are never duly touched and impressed with a conviction of their insignificance until they have contrasted themselves with the majesty of God. Hmm. Just see yourself alongside of God and then you'll understand what a sinner you are. This was not only true for Isaiah, but also Job says the same thing, Daniel, Peter, John. So we have the conviction of Isaiah. The conviction is, I've seen the glory and the majesty of God. Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. Notice now the cleansing of Isaiah, verses 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which had been taken from the, with the thongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity has been taken away, and your sins purged. So here's the, one of the seraphim. This is a vision. Keep in mind, it's a, it's a vision that he's seeing. And in this vision, he sees the seraphim come, and he takes a live coal from the altar of burnt offering. That was outside the temple. It was at the altar of burnt offering where the priest would offer animal sacrifices. That's where the blood of the animals was shed. And the altar of burnt offerings was what? Symbolic of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because the lambs that were sacrificed there were pure and white and without blemish. Just as Jesus was the perfect Son of God who went to the cross and bore in His body all of our sins. So that live coal came from the altar that offered temporary purification for the Jewish people when they offered a sacrifice on that altar. But you see, they had to do it every day, morning and evening. That's why when Christ died on the cross, remember what the writer of Hebrews said, He died once for all for the sins of mankind. He doesn't have to die over and over and over again like He does in the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> He died once. Whereas the animal sacrifices were done twice a day, over and over and over and over and over, because the forgiveness was temporary. But with Jesus Christ, the forgiveness is permanent. You see, we're covered with holy smoke. Now notice the call of Isaiah. You've seen the conviction of Isaiah. You've seen the cleansing of Isaiah. Now you have the call of Isaiah. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah had been serving the Lord, but now he has received an official call to be a prophet of God. He has been humbled, and now he has a clean heart. He has come to realize not only how unclean he was, but just how unclean before God the house of Israel was. He's now ready to hear the voice of God and to speak that which God wants him to say to his people. But I just want you to notice this phrase. It says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Did you notice that phrase? It's a plural pronoun. Who is us? That's the question we're asking. There's only one sitting on the throne, but who's going to go for us? I believe that's a reference to the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You see, it takes all three members of the Trinity in order for a person to be saved. God lays out the plan. Jesus Christ carries out the plan in His death on the cross, and the Holy Spirit convicts people to believe in Jesus and to repent of their sin, it takes all three members of the Trinity to bring about your salvation and to cover us with holy smoke. We need to know that God is still calling laborers into His harvest. That doesn't mean you have to go to Uganda or some far parts of the world, though many have, of course. It just means that we need to be a witness. We need to be able to say, as did Isaiah, here am I, Lord. Send me. That's what I had to say. Once I felt the conviction that God didn't want me to design automobiles any longer. I actually never did, but that was the goal. No, 
Ron, you're not going to work for General Motors. You're going to preach the gospel. And I'm in what? My 60th year. Well, let's look now at verses 9 through 13, which brings this chapter to a close, and we're going to talk about the atrocities of Israel. And this, of course, becomes a very difficult section in chapter 6. The of the hearts of the people. And he, the one on the throne, Jesus said, Go and tell this people. And this is what he's to tell them. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. That's the kind of people he's going to have to talk to. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Whoa! Isaiah is given a futile assignment. He's to preach to a nation that will not understand what he says or have any intention of getting their lives right with God. The people had not listened before, and they're not going to listen now. In fact, the people on hearing Isaiah's message would become even more hardened against the Lord. The gospel, pro either the, the, boss, the gospel, when it's proclaimed, either melts hearts or hardens them. There's no in-between. So some people you talk to about the Lord, they're going to be angry at you. Their hearts are going to be harder than ever before. They don't want to hear what you have to say. And other people, oh, man, that's good news. You see, there are many whose hearts are hardened today. They have such hatred in their hearts for God. The more they hear the gospel, the harder their hearts become. Why is that so? Hatred can make people unreasonable. It is almost impossible to convince someone of anything if they have a hatred directed toward that of which you are trying to convince them of. If they have a hatred toward it, it's, very, it's almost impossible for you to win them. We're living in a time in this country when there is a hatred for God. There's a hatred for you. And there's a hatred for me. And we had better wake up and understand that. After Easter, I think it's about four weeks after Easter, I'm going to talk more. I'm going to get off Isaiah for a week. I told you I was going to talk about gaslighting. And I'm going to talk about how we are being gaslit today. And we need It means, gaslighting means, that what you see with your eyes is not really what you see with your eyes. And that's exactly where we are today. Oh, there's no crisis on the borders. Yeah. That's 5,000 a day cross into our country. What I see with my eyes is not what I see with my eyes. That's what the world is trying to tell you. And I'm going to spend a whole hour on that. I think it's probably the most relevant message that I will have talked in some time because... I don't hear anybody talking about that aspect of our society today. I just accidentally came across this gaslighting story on the internet, and I thought, oh, it's kind of interesting. Oh, what? This is going to make a... Uh, hey, there's a lesson in this. Anyway, we'll move on. Well, as we said, there are many people today who hate God, yet God... Knowing that Isaiah would have little success, these people tells them to proclaim his word to them nonetheless. See? Even if they don't want to listen, we tell it anyway. Why? When the day of judgment comes, these people cannot plead their case before God, saying, I never knew you. I never heard your message before. You can't send me to hell when I don't know anything about what you have done or why you're doing it or why you're interested in me. What God is doing is covering his bases. He's eliminating all excuses that people might give him on Judgment Day. It's God saying to those who might come up with some excuse for not understanding who he is or what he desires, don't make that excuse to me, says the Lord. 
I sent you the prophets, and you ignored them. In fact, you did more than ignored them. You mocked them, you scourged them, you chained and imprisoned them. Some you stoned and sawed in two, and others you slain with a sword. Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 36. And Jewish tradition says Isaiah was sawed in two with a wooden saw. Can you imagine limb by limb being cut off your body with a wooden saw? That's not in the Bible. That's, that's Jewish tradition as to how Isaiah died. And the book of Hebrews talks about those who were sawed in two. It may seem strange to us that God is telling Isaiah, make the hearts of the people dull, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. It seems as though God does not even want them to see or hear or understand. I mean, that could be a conclusion you might draw from this. The best understanding of this, to me, is that God already knows their response to Isaiah's message. He already knows what they're going to do ahead of time, because our God is an omniscient God. He knows everything. And so, he's asking Isaiah here, or he's telling Isaiah, maybe something of a, a, a little sarcasm. And so, God can be a little sarcastic. He's so angry and so disgusted with his people that he mocks them. If they don't want to trust me, he says, I'll make sure they don't. Then he tells Isaiah, go proclaim that which I ask you, and I will make their hearts dull. I will shut their eyes and make their ears deaf to all that you say. I'll tell you, as a, as a pastor, I'd hate to have that assignment. That, that, would be, that would be terribly discouraging to me. To stand up Sunday after Sunday and spend hours, which I do, putting a lesson together. I see where uh, Eric spends 15 hours. I'll tell you, I spend 30 hours on what you get here in this class. That's not putting anybody down. Maybe he's, he's you know, he's 40 and I'm 80. My mind's a little slower than his. I remember being in seminary in, uh, in homiletics class, and they would tell you, you need to put in one hour for one every minute you preach. One hour ought to go into your sermon preparation for every, uh, for every minute you preach. Well, if you preach 40 minutes, that's 40 hours. And sometimes people wonder, what does that pastor do all week? besides counsel people and try to keep the ship going. The Apostle John, in reference to Jesus' ministry, we talked about this earlier, quotes these very words from Isaiah toward the religious leaders of his day. Their hearts were so hardened against Jesus that John writes of them, Therefore, they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. See, this is the evidence that I pointed out earlier. He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10, and he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the one who's sitting on the throne. Jesus is the one who's giving Isaiah this vision of the glory and the majesty of the Lord. I think it's important to note not even Jesus himself could, could convince the religious leaders that he was their prophet. So when we loved ones come to Christ, as hard as we have tried to win them over, we should feel sad and maybe even hurt, but we should not feel defeated. We did what we were called to do. If Jesus was oftentimes unsuccessful in winning people to Him, we should feel no guilt if we too end up in failure. 
There are people whose hearts are so callous toward God that nothing is going to change their mind. Then you have the charge given to Isaiah. We've seen the callousness of the people. Now notice the charge given to Isaiah. Then Isaiah, th then I said, Lord, how long? Isaiah saying, how long do you want me to preach? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without habitation, the houses are without man, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, but yet a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree, or as an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. Well, wow, that's a little complicated here. Let's see if we can unravel it. So there's two things I want to draw from this, and this will bring our lesson to its conclusion. First of all, prophesy, even though it will harden hearts. That's what he's saying. And Isaiah now wants to know, well, how long do you want me to prophesy? The Lord tells him to proclaim it until the judgment comes. That is, till the Babylonian exile, when the people would no longer be in their land, with its ruined cities and barren fields. Isaiah didn't even live long to see the Babylonian captivity. You remember Isaiah started prophesying in 740 B.C., the year King Uzziah died. It was Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon who destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple and took the people into captivity in 586 B.C. There's 154 years of time have passed. Isaiah didn't live that long. And yet what God is saying to Isaiah, how long do you want me to preach this message and no one is listening to? Well, I want you to keep on preaching as if you would live to see Judah's downfall. You're not going to live to see Judah's downfall? I'm just telling you, keep going, keep going, keep going. Don't stop. Because the judgment day is coming. After the Babylonian captivity, a tenth of the people would be left in the land. These would be people who never went into captivity. We talked about that when we were in chapter 2, I think, of Isaiah. They were the ones left behind. They were the poor. They were the elderly. They were the crippled. So he's just saying not everybody's going into captivity. There are those left behind. But the next thing is proclaim a remnant will survive. So now Isaiah is getting a little bit of encouragement here. Everything up to this point has been kind of negative. You're going to preach to people who aren't going to listen. In fact, the more you preach to them, the harder their hearts are going to be. But he says, uh, there is going to be a remnant of Jews who are going to believe and be saved. Not everyone is going to be saved. It's absolutely important that Judah survive because, remember, from the tribe of Judah, the Messiah came. If the tribe of Judah was totally wiped out, there'd be no Messiah. So God compared this remnant to the stumps of the terebinth and oak trees. When cut down, they will sprout again, this time from the holy seed of a believing remnant. They will, in turn, they in turn would see that others will come to believe in the true God as well. Though Judah's population would almost totally be wiped out or exiled, God promised to preserve a remnant of Jews. And what Isaiah's learning here is, yes, even though no one is going to listen to my message, even though my people are going to go into exile, God is still going to raise up a remnant of Jews who are going to be saved. And they're going to come from that holy seed. It's like you cut down a tree, like an oak tree, you cut it down. You, hey, the tree's dead, you think. But then springtime comes, yoop, up the little shoot comes up, you know. A tree, that tree's coming back to life. And so it appears as though the Jewish people are dead, but no. A holy seed is going to bring them back to life again because our God is faithful. Our God is a covenant-honoring God. He made a covenant with His people, and He cannot...
against his word. Judah and the house of Israel had proved unfaithful to God, but listen, but God was not going to give up on them. He had made a promise that his people would survive to the end of time, and a remnant of believing Jews would be regathered in the land of Israel, and ultimately be established as the prime nation in the world during the time of the millennial reign of Christ. God's blessing to the world will once again flow through the Jewish people, and thus, when a Jew walks by, ten Gentiles will grab his robe and say, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. This reminds me of those words of the Apostle Paul. Here's the verse I want you to leave with today. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. If we are faithless, ah, if we are faithless, Who here has not been faithless? Who here has not been faithful? If we are faithless, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. That's a tremendous truth to comprehend. As believers, we fail God all the time, but He never fails us. He's faithful toward us because He cannot deny Himself. That is, He cannot go back on His Word. And this word that is translated deny can also be translated disown. God cannot disown himself. He will never deny who he is. Therefore, he will not deny or discern, or rather, or or disown. He will not deny or disown even the most unprofitable members of his own family. True children of God cannot become something other than his children. Haven't we all failed him sometime, huh? Yeah. And even in our failure, God still calls us His children. This is so when we are disobedient and weak, Christ's faithfulness to Christians is not contingent on our faithfulness to Him. Aren't you glad about that? What a God we serve. He's faithful to His Word. He will always follow through with what He says He's going to do. Trust is an important of any relationship, and that is true in our relationship with God. It was the prophet Jeremiah who said, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God can be trusted for three reasons. He's holy. He will not lie to us. He's just. He will do what is right. He's faithful. He's always dependable. What a God we serve, right? Amen. So in our lesson today, we see God's promise to secure the Jewish people to the very end, to save a remnant in spite of how hostile historically the Jews have been toward Him. The good news for all of us is He demonstrates that same faithfulness to us, His children, even when we fail Him. God cannot deny or disown His children even when we fail Him, any more than He can deny or disown Himself. And that is the thought I want to leave you with. Amen.